subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Ms. Anisha Nair Dhawan, she is a versatile TV actor and reporter with 18 years of uh, experience across leading networks in India and anchoring, scripting and reporting. She has expertise in producing shows, handling breaking news on and off camera, interviewing top industry leaders, politicians and celebrities. Thank you Ms. Dhawan for moderating this session today. Now I leave over the conversation to you to take it forward. Thank you so much, Ajansh, and I want to thank uh, speaking uh, for giving me this opportunity to be able to speak uh, to uh, Harriet Green, uh, one of the best known British businesswomen of our time. I am so honored to speak to you and highly privileged to learn from you. You're a thought leader and influencer who has always spoken so passionately about leadership, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Harriet, for being with us. It's very much my pleasure after that build up. We better give some good inputs to those on the webinar, right? Harriet, first of all, I, I see that you have a new crop. So you're sporting a different look. Um, is there some reason behind this? Or is it that, uh, you know, the salons are closed and you couldn't find a hairdresser to help you? <laughs> yeah, it's a COVID cut. A lot of people had a COVID cut for charity. My husband very kindly um, used the, the, the clippers and uh, this is the look. So uh, um, the great thing about a haircut is mostly it grows. So we're in the process and it reminds me of COVID and about, you know, for all of us looking at who we really are and seeing if it's what we like. Right. That's really an innovative uh, way of thinking because uh, a lot of us are uh, begrudging those luxuries that we don't have. But, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Nearly everyone is gripped with fear for their health, for their well-being, for even their livelihoods. We're all looking to our leaders uh, for answers, for them to show us a way out. Uh, whether it is in our offices, whether it is in our countries, we want somebody to help us navigate the times. Do you think that we will amble through this crisis by the skin of our teeth or will the quality of leadership that we have actually determine the, out uh, the outcome? So I think it's very dependent. You know, there are a number of uh, uh, variables, uh, Anisha, that I think are important. There are geographical. Uh, uh, for example, I think Asia has had more experience uh, of dealing uh, with some of the uh, pandemics of the past um, as culturally, you know, the wet markets and, and some of what has happened over the last decade. Mm -hmm. And I think generally showed greater preparedness. Um, and, and then I think there are differences you know, uh, uh, across democratic environments mm. and those that have a much more one party or uh, uh, a zero party uh, 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 sort of leadership. So I think it's highly dependent. But I think there are three things that are essential, whether you're leading a company, a mm. country, uh, and we can see uh, uh, that across the globe. The first is to be honest uh, about the brutal facts. I think, uh, unfortunately, there's so much political massaging uh, mm. uh, to try and cover tracks, to make things look better than they are, rather than dealing quickly with the brutal facts. Whether that's the brutal facts of track and trace is absolutely non-negotiably vital uh, mm. to prevent second waves, whether it's the fact that numbers need to include all of those brutally mm. caught within the net, uh, uh, whether it's those migrant workers returning to their homes because there is no work in the larger cities, uh, in the West, those in care homes, and how the policies around that will change. And then I think the third element of leadership is providing a vision of what the world will look like uh, post-COVID in uh, what people are calling N squared, N to the power of two, and new normal. And I hope we'll talk about what that hope and vision uh, will be like uh, as we try and prepare our workforce and try and develop a very inclusive and diverse response to our future.
Right. Had it, uh, one of the points you raised was that um, if our leaders are transparent and they lay it out bare, um, there is a better way forward. But on the flip side, don't you think this fans uh, further fear, panic? We saw, uh, you know, in the United States initially, uh, the U.S. president said everything is under control. Uh, we're not going to be affected by this because the numbers are too low. Everything is fine. Till, till nearly February, this was the case. But then we saw panic, people rushing through, uh, you know, stores running out of supplies, no sanitizers, no toilet paper. Uh, even in companies, if I am looking at a time where there are no revenues, there are no sales, you know, if I... How do I put it out uh, transparently hmm. to my employees and be a great leader? Doesn't that strong panic? Yeah, I think, um, and I've written about this during the course of the last couple of months. I think being clear what the brutal facts are in any given situation and then how you message your own and your country's, your company's position on these critical issues in a balanced, thoughtful way is indeed the role of leadership. So when you have a platform of the brutal facts, then you can move to, so what do we do about it? What do we do now? What do we do in the next stage? And what is the future vision? And so I think if people detect that there aren't the facts being shared, that it isn't given in a balanced, open way for the benefit of employees, citizens, then people do react very badly. There are already many studies that say people's optimism, their sense of personal resilience is deeply affected you know, by where we are at this time. And it is our job as leaders to really help um, take action. So first of all, what is the plan? What are we going to do? How are we going to generate uh, new products, new services in this digital age? What is everyone's role in that? What are some dramatic actions that we're going to take? Whether it's, um, you know, the actions of, of um, not supporting face recognition, uh, um, but every single company and government needs a clear plan that is communicated and then individually connected with the team so that we avoid the type of panic or, or uh, uh, lack of positivity, fear, and, and one's own personal resilience being eroded because we just don't know who to trust. And I would say, Anisha, that for me, the center of this vortex is trust. Who do we trust? Who do we follow? Uh, and the responsibilities that go with that followership. Right. How did you said we need to have a vision and we need to have a plan? Now, true leaders are ones who can look ahead and perhaps, you know, have an inkling on what will work in the future. At this point of time, a lot of leaders are perhaps looking clueless. They're just reacting to what has happened. Uh, companies are reacting to what has happened. Uh, there is a pandemic. They want work done, but they want the employees safe. So work from home. This isn't a vision. This is a reaction. So when there is so much uncertainty, when you do not know what lies next, how will you come up with a vision? Uh, how do you, is it by consensus? Is it by information? How do you think? Yeah, I, I, yes, I think uh, a couple of responses to that. First of all, I think all of us can, with the data available, kind of predict or, or present scenarios as to what the future looks like. You know, many people have already written about this, but whether it's, you know, a future where the virus is mostly controlled, uh, where economies bounce back, uh, uh, and, um, you know, the, the demands are for greater job security, new products, new services. If that is a scenario uh, for India, for the company you work in, or is it, is it, um, is it a much more uh, 
you know, uh, concerned from the data sort of scenario where, um, you know, uh, uh, there is some control, but there is a wave two. Uh, some have called this the growing divide, increasing nationalism, where globalization is, is, is frowned upon and no one can speak honestly about what is happening in your country because there is a deeper a sort of nationalism. So point number one is, I think groups of people with the data available to a country, to a company, to a unit, to a family, what do we think the scenario is? The virus is mostly controlled, uh, the virus is totally controlled, there is a prolonged recession and social distancing becomes the norm, uh, or, or we have a full-blown kind of pretty horrific recession in most well-developed economies. I think that needs to be, you know, holistic. You know, there's no point saying, well, we've done a good job. We've got the greatest cash reserves, you know, in the top five. We did better than, you know, Iceland. You know, these, these things are almost uh, I I irrelevant. So what what do we think, whatever that unit of we is, will happen next? And then I think uh, uh, the, the sort of using that fact-based, the psychology, really involving our family, our team, our people, our employees, our citizens in kind of that vision of going forward, really helping to generate optimism and positivity based on a lot of communication, a lot of trust building, a lot of support. Um, and, and that, you know, that isn't about giving dates and then failing on them. It's not about giving numbers that exclude whole rafts of people. I believe that transparency at this time is an enormous part of the trust agenda. And then physiologically, so what are we practically gonna do? For example, if we say we're going to, going forward, have a much more diverse team, we're going to be an inclusive company uh, with all of the issues around, uh, um, you know, age and sex and color and creed and sexuality. Let's really have the most inclusive and diverse teams. So what steps are we going to take? What are the actions that together we work on to make that plan part of our systems, our processes, and the go forward. Uh, and I think that's extremely important for growth, innovation-led growth. How do we mobilize people to truly capture uh, a, a growth mindset? When you think about 1957, after the pandemic then, Sony, through that pandemic came up, with the transistor radio. After the dot-com bubble burst, you know, the first uh, iPod was released. Uh, Adobe used the period after the 2008 financial crisis to transform their approach to software as a service as opposed to an on-premise set of solutions. So I, I think it is, you know, very important that companies um, look at what are our systems and processes that are going to be different. Because if we just have the same ones, we'll reinforce the past. I, I love the way Tata, for example, has a, an amazing uh, uh, initiative about dare to try. And what dare to try is if you actually try something and it fails, let, let's come together as the CDA team to determine why it failed uh, and, and what we can do about that. This is a great time for innovation, uh, for creativity. It's also a, a wonderful way for all of us to be galvanized into positive uh, uh, action. And then the third part of that is about our structure. Uh, if we're gonna change our processes, our systems, what are we gonna do to make our structure uh, uh, of our unit, our government, our business different. It's a wonderful opportunity um, to, I, I'm sure some 
unacceptable leader of the past said this, but you know, never waste a great crisis. And we shouldn't if it means motivating and empowering our people to trust, to take that transparency and to think about innovation-led growth. That's what we're all looking for in businesses for sure. Mm. Definitely, uh, Harriet, uh, innovation during the times of uncertainty, you know, you all have to think out of the box. You all have to come up with something new. Uh, you know, even the crisis gives you an opportunity. Uh, but mm. there are scenarios that you have to paint and then you will plan according to different scenarios. To your mind, what do you think will be the outlook uh, for the world, for your country, for the UK, for India, for the world uh, in the next uh, couple of years. You spoke of nationalism, but that isn't something that is happening just because of the pandemic. That's something that has started happening even before that. We saw trade wars, you know, we're better than you. Uh, the US versus China that had already started nationalism. Perhaps mm. I feel that that was another reason why the egos of two people, uh, you know, came in the way of collaboration to stem this pandemic in its bud, uh, to nip the bud. It didn't happen because there were two big egos. So, uh, you know, nationalism is there and, you know, perhaps our borders aren't going to be that open for some time to come. But what do you think the world will look like in the next couple of years? I think that um, one thing that, that, or a couple of things that haven't changed that we should build upon. The first is the importance of data. You know, back to my point about what are the facts. In any given situation, country, business, what are the facts? How do we propel ourselves to create new products, new services from the data that we have? What data do we need uh, to be innovative? What is the data that's necessary for transparency? And certain in, in democracies, that's hugely important. The second is we have an innate responsibility as humans on this planet to be being inclusive uh, 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 post this pandemic. That instead of becoming more vertical, more polarized around the elite and around people just like us, that we have an amazing opportunity to enfranchise the uniqueness of individuals because of that uniqueness and because they will help us with better solutions that benefit all. So I think that data, uh, 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 diversity and inclusion is very important uh, and being optimistic around the potential to get our industries back up and running, whether that's the car industry, whether it's new uses of AI in agriculture, uh, uh, new apps so that microloans for the farmers in some of the remote provinces are even more equipped for them to get back uh, uh, to farming the land. There are a plethora of positive, innovative things if we can create the right mindset. And in my experience, regardless of the country you're in or the great medium or terrible leadership that you have, uh, uh, one can galvanize positivity by thinking about how together we innovate by getting diverse groups of people looking at the problem that we're trying to solve, whatever that may be. Uh, um, you know, and there are many. How we ensure that we don't zoom backwards and the 1% air quality improvement that we have all experienced, that we can see the Himalayas from your bedroom, uh, are not totally lost whilst not creating the biggest single depression for the globe that the world has ever seen. These are all first, second, third, and fourth world problems that we can participate in if we choose to. And as leaders, we need that trust and transparency so that people want to follow us and want to engage to get to the next space and the next space after that. And history supports, particularly in tech, uh, these downturns really helping uh, to create a new way forward. 
So that's definitely right. We can, you know, galvanize action on our own. But for individuals, Harriet, if you're so consumed by what you don't have, by criticism of how your government or your uh, company leadership is not coming together in this uh, crisis, is that the mindset that will, uh, you know, take us ahead? And is that the mindset that will take us towards uh, growth in the future? Uh, is it time that we stop complaining about what didn't happen and think about how we are going to make a difference? Like, you know, uh, in India, uh, there's a, you know, there is a simmering criticism of the government that we had a lot that we paralyzed the whole economy. It was to prepare ourselves better to deal with the pandemic. And now in a, a city like Delhi, which is our capital, uh, we are seeing a hue and cry of medical facilities not being enough, not th there are not enough beds. And it, it's, it's a huge problem. There's fear. But uh, as a community, uh, how will we move ahead if we can't go get over our criticism of what was not done? Just because something was not done, should we just, just you know, give up? What can we do in companies? You know, you have work from home, and um, there are endless hours, and you're so afraid that you will not have a job that you don't raise your voice and say, "This isn't fair. Why should I be working all the time? Where is my life otherwise?" So you know. Um, as individuals, uh, being big hearted and working together, is that the way forward? And is that how we will get into growth mindset? Well, I think again, <clears throat> it's very dangerous and difficult to generalize. As a victim of domestic violence, as a, 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 a man mostly, who loses his life on the journey from a big city in India uh, to his more remote state, uh, to people who couldn't have a funeral for their families that died during COVID uh, in, in Western countries. So we should never, um, we should absolutely never forget uh, that you and I are talking from an immensely privileged position. And so are most of the people I suspect who may have joined this speaking. But I do think there are positive actions that we can take. Around the world, there has been an absolute outpouring of volunteering. I, for one, um, volunteering with the National Health Service, these are not grand jobs creating new AI tools. You know, these are packing PPE, delivering boxes, and doing what I can to improve uh, 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 the situation. The second, uh, 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 is that I think there's been an outpouring of community, people coming together to help the old, to help the disadvantaged, training to be a domestic violence counselor uh, uh, as that rages. So I do think there is a great deal uh, that we can be doing ourselves uh, to give the time uh, to help and to feel better. I also believe that we all need to have the skills that the world needs. Uh, and those are not all STEM skills. Uh, the world needs plumbers, the world needs uh, agriculturalists, the world needs journalists and marketeers. What are the skills that we can acquire in this time? You know, two hours a day to read better books, to learn more things, to learn a language, the amazing online courses to do better yoga, to meditate, to learn Chinese, uh, uh, to improve one's understanding of Buddhism. These are fundamental things to both enriching us and improving us to play a part in the world. And a question just came up on the chat line about, well, isn't innovation-led growth kind of expensive? I think if you can mobilize the employees that you have, into participating, breaking down. I wrote about this, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, mm -hmm. breaking down our problems of companies into bite-sized portions and an hour every day brainstorming innovation-led solutions by employees that mm -hmm. we take to our managers and leaders is a remarkably uh, cost-effective way of moving problems forward. It does require us to determine what are the problems that we're going to focus on, uh, 
but it is certainly significantly cheaper than trying to buy a large company that might be in difficulty itself at this time. Mm -hmm. Had it, um, you know, uh, we are talking of innovation and you've come up with great ideas how this can be a collaborative process and it doesn't necessarily have to be costly. But uh, companies, you know, ha should, should do this to grow in the future, but should also care for the people who work for them. Now, uh, when the lockdown happened, we had heard, uh, you know, appeals uh, from the government to pay your part time uh, employees. Play, pay the employees who are working for you uh, for, you know, let them not fall on hard times. How do you see the response of companies, uh, big companies in our country towards the labor problem uh, that we saw, the migration of how, uh, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, casual laborers were just stranded in cities and kept walking for miles and miles uh, to get home? Uh, is it a collective failure of uh, all of us, not just the government who did not plan for this, but uh, for people who had employed them? Yes, I, I think that the, the issue of companies' responsibilities is huge around the globe. And we're operating, I think, in a very, very different time where every company's brand, their name, whether they're a founder, owner, you know, fifth generation, uh, uh, an MNC, a small startup, every company's brand, their commitment and their promise is under scrutiny at this time. How they treat their employees in a world that has a voice, how they respond to inclusion, diversity, uh, um, how they operate in this period around rents, around migrant workers, around uh, uh, helping people. And ultimately, employees have choice. Uh, even in, in the lowest paid jobs, there will be choice. Obviously, there's not choice if you're dead. And so uh, those that have helped ensure that people stay alive and and support others is hugely important. But this is not like prior pandemics where the voice of the historians had the power, the voice of the government had the power. It is the voice of every one of us using social media uh, uh, and helping our companies to do good uh, uh, because everyone is watching. Those companies that are not behaving well that are not treating one another fairly. Within hours and days, uh, 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 um, there is someone that you can talk to to get that you know, on, online uh, um, if you need to. And so I think that we need to make sure as companies that you know, the categories of what did you do in the pandemic? Were you great? You know, companies that did great things, kind things, moving things, transparent things, trustworthy things. Were you average who had to be prompted to make a statement on All Lives Matter? Uh, uh, or were you downright awful? Uh, uh, and, you know, people will know. So we should use our voice. Mm -hmm. India is the biggest democracy in the world. Sadly, not everyone has access to a phone, but most people know someone who does, mm -hmm. and people should speak up. Otherwise, you have no right to complain. If you don't voice uh, uh, what you think should be changed and some of the improvements you'd like to see, heralding the great and the good and highlighting when it's not good and could be better. So there is a personal responsibility as well as a, a company responsibility uh, with the investors and the boards of those companies and the government taking their responsibilities too. Right. So Harit, uh, speaking about the government, we have got a question from Abhay Naram. 
He's saying when the government uh, instructed us to pay our employees, but they did not see small startups uh, and smaller companies, how pressed they were. They did not provide them adequate help to the business. How can we pay our employees? Uh, how was this step taken correctly? You may ask me to pay my employees, but I have no revenues. I'm a small team. Uh, I was looking at yes. the government yeah. this time and I didn't get it. Like we've seen uh, governments in Canada, in the US, come out with a lot of welfare checks in everybody's um, uh, banks because uh, you know they are of a job or uh, there's been um, income loss. That's not the case in India. So uh, will there be different parameters to judge companies as well? Yes, I think absolutely. I think it is for every employee uh, to be judging. Indeed, many countries, including my own, uh, provided government support as people were furloughed, companies had to close. And I think those companies uh, and those countries that behaved in that way set a very, very high bar. I think for those that don't, uh, the responsibility on the small, medium, indeed larger companies to be connecting with their employees, uh, helping to provide the necessary links that they can learn a skill, uh, that they can communicate with each other. Uh, it's not going to give them bread on the table right now. Uh, uh, and back to my points about as a community and as individuals, what can we be doing, not just relying on companies, to, to embrace this can-do this mm. positive volunteering activism and this community effort, as well as companies being able to do what they can, because everyone will know how an individual and how a company acted during COVID. Everyone will know. And we want to all uh, be classed as those who, even if the government were unable to spend their mighty reserves on supporting the community, then what did we as business leaders do to keep the spirits, the education, the skills, and the brand of our company alive and kicking? And there are amazing examples of what Indian companies have done to create uh, uh, manufacturing skills, to create strong communities, and we need all of us to be thinking in that innovative and creative way. And people want to help because they want to be part of something that's good. They don't want to be festering at home, moaning and complaining. They want to lift themselves from that. Definitely. Uh, had you spoken um, uh, many times about diversity, about inclusion. Now, at a time when uh, people are just, uh, you know, grappling uh, with the pandemic, with job loss, with, with, with so many issues and uncertainty, we've seen riots in the United States. Uh, uh, we've seen this whole campaign about Bli Black Lives Matter, uh, about uh, uh, protests even in Europe. Now, why is inclusion important? And why are we not getting there? Why is it so difficult to understand? Uh, is the huge, uh, that's a mighty huge question, Anisha, but let me try and break it down. I mean, I, I, I really believe as a businesswoman, as a volunteer, as a mom, that being inclusive, uh, involving the broadest range of people because of their age, their sex, their color, uh, their sexuality, their creed, their physical ability, because you are most likely to get the best solution. If you track the worst business failures, the worst disasters, the things that have happened to people, whether it's Bhopal or whatever, have been led by one group of individuals who all look like each other, all doing herd think going off in a particular direction. And having those with the courage, the education, and the skills to say, you know, I have a different view, and maybe we could solve this problem in a different way. And so for me, the reason I love inclusion and diversity is because in all cases, it helps me to solve the problems that I am dealing with. Secondly, it is a deeply 
humanistic way of viewing the world. If you only like people who look like you or talk like you, how rich is that? How global is that in the sense of uh, 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 existing together on this planet? And much of what we are seeing right now is people not dealing with these issues 300 years ago, 200 years ago, or 100 years ago, when those issues were still wrong and still not helpful to the furtherance of mankind. So I think now is a brilliant time uh, to make a plan for each company or each unit or each village or each... Uh, leader of each village to say, you know, this is how we're going to approach the go forward. We want, this is our plan. These are our targets and our goals. This is what we're going to do tomorrow to clearly state what's going to be different. And you will see the reaction of most that this is a great thing to do, uh, to be a more, a company that people feel co more comfortable trusting and obviously, one needs to speak in the language uh, of the reality of that company, of that unit, of that village, of that state, uh, uh, to create a greater sense of well-being. As like, you said earlier, Anisha, and I think it's huge, people are very frightened right now. They're very low. And uh, if we are drawing our energy from doing some of these things, we should involve others. Uh, um, and it's not all huge, grand investment. My little team and I that are packing PPE uh, mm -hmm. for district nurses and doctors, you know, we lift each other as we do a very menial task, unpaid, uh, uh, to help the community. So I think every one of us uh, mm -hmm. uh, can think about what we would like to be different going forward in the world and in our little part of it and start to enact that individually, collectively, for our countries, our units, our companies, whether they're small, medium, and large. We have a voice. The reason that recent events are transcending the globe mm. is because other activists 50 years ago or 100 years ago did not have these very tools. Let's use them. Yes. Uh, Harriet, uh, you said that uh, it's upon us to help change and take everybody along with us. Now, in the, in the new world, there is no running away from technology. Everybody will have to adopt it, right? And, uh, you know, at a time when people are going to be working out of home, do you think this whole drive towards inclusion, to diversity, will actually be beneficial? Because this is a way you'll be able to bring in more women into the workforce. And that has a very positive effect, not only in the country, but even in companies. When you're looking for ideas, when you're looking for innovation, try something different. Isn't this a golden opportunity to do that? I, I, I think so, Anisha, um, particularly in India. India will never achieve its economic dream and its goals if the 51.6% of the population that are women are, are more actively engaged. And that is why last year, um, you know, one of the great programs uh, 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 building on the excellent government initiative for MNCs to invest with a greater sense of good tech and corporate responsibility, you know, enabled uh, four million teachers and a million young women to be connected and understand, understand the STEM skills uh, uh, so that they could start to decide whether they were good at maths, whether they liked coding, and all the work we did across the provinces that embraced this were extremely positive. So again, if the goal is for India to be the leading economic power in the whole world, which is an admirable goal, then the entire workforce, because of its age, because of its, its color, its creed, its gender, uh, uh, its physical ability, will need to be embraced. And that doesn't have to be on some flashy, expensive technology. Look at the State Bank of India. There isn't an older company in India that has embraced great technology 
on a form and function phone where you can get, download an app in one click, get a micro loan for a tractor or whatever. That is technology that enables the people. Uh, and in three clicks and a bit of help, you can download an AI app to understand every stream of weather that has ever affected your area over a period of time, amortize that data to help make predictions so that the locusts or the, or, or, or the drought, uh, that preemptive steps may be taken. So I believe there is a great deal uh, that can be done. And I am seeing some chat that comes up and says, you know, this is all a pipe dream. These are practical things that I have done in India that are not hugely expensive that many corporations, whether it's Mahindra, Tata, IBM, Microsoft, Google, small and medium companies are doing that give me great hope about the future. But there needs to be trust and transparency and we need to take all people with us. Right. How do you, uh, there's a question coming in from Surya and you spoke of technology. So he says, do you feel even small companies will no longer be limited to any geography and they can become truly global and distribute worldwide? Do you think uh, through this uncertainty, it's time to think big? Totally. I mean, it is staggering how few companies have embraced the, the, the simplest of digital tools. Let me give you an example. I'm a, 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 a Hatha and Ylanga, a, a yoga, Iyengar yoga practitioner, and I couldn't go to my classes. And so I, I looked online, and there are amazing, in my last class, there was amazing woman from Gujarati province and uh, someone from California, someone from the UK, all helping us try and reach a, a, a meditative state uh, and, and use our bodies, bodies in a more powerful way. You know, a simple app, simply shot, beautifully done, very well thought of, available, you know, yep. all of the marketing tools via LinkedIn, via Instagram, uh, uh, via Twitter, all of these tools exist. Uh, um, all of us can get better at using them so we can brand the simplest uh, of capabilities that really resonates. You don't need to be huge. You don't need, you know, billions of rupees investment over six years to develop innovation. We can all start doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I want to start a little app uh, uh, to sell our honey. Our bees are going crazy. We can't eat it all or give it away. Um, you know, uh, amazing little coffee apps are, 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 are being developed as people import, import quality coffee and sell it under their brand. There is so much that we can do uh, uh, to move forward. Harris, it's been great talking to you, but we want to learn a little more about you. What I've learned about you is that you are a younger yoga practitioner. You have surplus bees. And there is a question from Arjun, uh, who has been following you and he, uh, he likes the choice of books. So he's asking, I've been actively following the books you share online. How do you choose your books and what are your recommendations in the current time? Oh, well, thank you for reading those reviews. I have a lot of reviews out there. A new one coming up, which has been one of my best uh, so far of lockdown called Killing Commendatore uh, by a very well-known Japanese writer. I'm also writing, uh, reading a book right now called My Dark Vanessa, which is very much about the Me Too movement and the French elite. Um, um, when is rape rape and when is it two people of very different ages coming together. So I, I'm an avid reader. I, I, I take the recommendations that people give me on the LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and uh, uh, Insta feed, and I'm working my way through those, and I'm open to recommendations, and I'm so happy that the reviews are helpful to you. Okay, so Harriet uh, loves reading books, is into yoga, has surplus uh, honey, honey. Milk, and also is volunteering in uh, packing PPEs for the NHS. 
And it, what else? What else in your personal life uh, do you like to dwell on? Do you like to spend time on? So I, I think uh, as we round this out and finish it, uh, we don't have any more questions. I would just say, you know, I, I think this is a time for those of us who can, those of us are blessed enough to be healthy and well, uh, to give of ourselves to be positive, to take some of that energy we have, you know, to moan about the government or the NHS or whatever, and channel that in to feeling better about the world we live in and prepare ourselves for whatever, you know, the, the scenario is as we exit COVID, whether it's the virus is mostly controlled and the economy has bounced back but continues to be unpredictable right the way through to, you know, it, it, it lasts another 12 months and there's enormous damage. Get prepared with your view of the facts and get some positive energy where we can to help those who simply can't help themselves. Those who are sick, those who die on the roadside when they make their way back to their province, those businesses that are really struggling. Let's put our positive energies into being able to answer that question when our children say, mom, dad, cousin, auntie, what did you do in the last pandemic? Uh, and we're able to show tangible that we're better people and we did better things. Thank you so much, Harry. There are such positive words from your, from your side. Seriously, uh, we need to have something to tell our kids that we did was positive uh, when we came out of this uh, pandemic and uh, we need to move, we need to do things and uh, stop with our negativity. Thank you so much, uh, Harry, for speaking with us. It was a great pleasure to hear you, uh, your insights into leadership, uh, into you know your own thinking, how companies can think, how individuals can think, and galvanize uh, ourselves into positive action is really, really endearing. It's very inspiring. Thank you so much, Harit, for taking time. Thank you all. Thank you for joining, and thank you very much, Anisha. You're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you so much. Uh, a big thank you to all those who also tuned in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and stay tuned to speak it for uh, more doses of wisdom and insights.